Welcome to our service today. Um, you might have noticed I am not Jean Monaghan. Uh, she is having a little issue with illness, so I'm covering today. So instead of the workshop service we're going to be having today, we're having a service about the life of the Reverend Margaret Barr, uh, the Lady of the Carsey Hills. As ever, if anyone's joining us online, welcome. We are recording, but as ever, the camera is just pointed at me as the worship leader and anybody else doing some reading. Before we light our chalice, let's have our value statement that shows us how, uh, that we hold many different beliefs and we're many different people. As a community, these are our shared values. We castle on time Unitarians welcome all who seek the meaning of life and who believe that human spirituality is wider than any one tradition and deeper than any one set of opinions. With a respect to our Christian origins, we seek to explore truths from all sources. Our fellowship gives us strength and encouragement in daily living. Our chalice today is lit with some words from Rabindranath Tagore. Light, oh, where is the light? Kindle it with desire. Let not the hours pass by in the dark. Kindle the lamp of love with your life. Obviously this service is about Reverend Margaret Barr. Uh, some of you may have heard of her or read about her in the Enquirer. Obviously there's a picture of her looking a little bit windblown on the front of the order of service. <laughs> Um, but others may not have heard of her at all. Um, so, reading one um, is a Yorkshire girl in India, and it's based on some writings by Joan Wilkinson. There's been a bit of a move recently to try and uncover more histories of Unitarian women um, and in some of the amazing work that they did. Uh, I've actually had to try quite hard myself because we do actually have we have actually had a woman, a female minister in our own history, Lillian Preston. Uh, that was back in the 1930s. Uh, despite our best efforts, Morris Large and I weren't able to find out more about her, other than that she served with the Red Cross uh, during the war. Uh, we think she probably worked at the Biker uh, Unitarian Mission, uh, which existed in the early part of the last century. Um, so that's a little bit of work the two of us tried to do. Perhaps at some point we'll uncover a bit more. But this is part of that, uh, and Margaret Barr really did have quite a fascinating life. Uh, which I hope to convince everybody of over the past hour, otherwise this is going to be a long service. Yes. Um, but here's a bit about the work she did to support people in India develop their communities. So a very short biography. Like me, uh, she was a Yorkshire lady. She was born in 1899 in Menston, West Yorkshire, uh, never been there, Oops. Uh, to a Methodist family, also like me. Um, Educated at Leeds High School for Girls, I went to Wakefield High School, there the similarity ends. She studied at Girton College in Cambridge uh, between 1920 to 1923. She read English and Moral Sciences and she attended the Memorial Church there in Cambridge where the minister, Reverend Cyril Flower, had a keen interest in the religions of the world and she said, I became a Unitarian in 1921. She did teacher training uh, at Homerton College, teaching in Wales and London. She attended Manchester College, Oxford, to train for the Unitarian Ministry. Uh, Manchester College is now Harris Manchester College, and should anyone ever want to know where all our historical items have gone, they have gone there. I handed them over, actually it was the day before yesterday, um, which was probably hilarious for anybody watching, as myself and one of the senior fellows there uh, unloaded everything from a small Toyota into a bigger Volvo. It was a bit of a clown show, really. Um, but if you want to know where the big square wooden clock that was in the Durant Hall, um, the old clock that used to be in the strong room, or the birthday chair, or anything like that have gone, they will be on display uh, at Harris Manchester College. And perhaps I'll get a chance to visit there and take some photos. But they have gone to a good home, and they were very appreciative. That side, that side bar aside, let's go back to Margaret Barr. Um, she was first a lay pastor, then a minister at Rotherham Unitarian Church uh, between 1927 to 1933, uh, and she would visit Great Hook Lane and Flag on her moped in her spare time, 
which for a single lady travelling about on a moped uh, in the early 1930s must have been quite an adventurous <laughs> pursuit. Um, in 1933, she sailed to India and took up a post as a religious education teacher at the Gokhali Memorial Girls School in Calcutta, which is now known as Kolkata. That uh, experience led to her writing her first book, The Great Unity, A New Approach to Religious Education, which was published by the Lindsay Press back in 1937. She had also met Mahatma Gandhi and been inspired by his teachings. Between 1934 to 1935, she began to pay informal visits to the churches and villages of the Kazi Hills, and this is where Joan Wilkinson picks up the story. She writes, Reverend Margaret Barr's vision was to build a stronger India based on liberal and Unitarian Universalist principles. She was never a missionary though, and objected quite strongly to that term and repeated that throughout her life. She was held in great esteem by those she worked with and whoever she came into contact with. That didn't mean she was a meek and mild soul, as she certainly stood up to those who might wish to shape her life. The General Assembly of Unitarians, back in Britain, certainly thought it unsuitable for a woman to go, <laughs> times have changed, um, and letters to her mother in illustrate how far she had moved <coughs> to Unitarian Universalism and against anything that smacked of missionary work in her determination to carve out her own future with the villages of the Kazi Hills. We read how she followed her sister Mary, who was one of the early village workers with Mahatma Gandhi, and how she spent time with him and appreciated the advice he gave to her in her search to find out how she could be most useful to the Indian people. He told her to keep out of jail and find some constructive work to do. First, she taught comparative religion at a non-Christian girls' school in Calcutta, where she was encouraged to write that book, The Great Unity, and in her holiday time, she visited the Kasi Unitarians that she had learned about whilst at Oxford. And in 1936, she made her home among them as a representative of the Unitarian General Assembly. We'll hear a little bit more about the history of the Kasi Unitarians coming up. There was a great deal of poverty, illiteracy and ill health in the villages around. So she decided to commit herself to developing basic education. She never forgot the lessons she had learned from Gandhi as through her life the project grew, providing not only educational provision, but also health care. In the book, Margaret Barr, A Universal Soul, we hear of how those she met and lived with in India revered her and interacted with her day by day, how she encouraged them to be liberal and generous in the new India they were building. There are touching stories of her last few years and her final illnesses how, in a coma, people carried her on their backs to the hospital 12 miles away because they could not afford to wait for a jeep to arrive. <coughs> Thankfully, the jeep did get through to them when the party had struggled halfway there. She writes of her love of reading the Sermon on the Mount alongside the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita. And our own Unitarian Hindu network has done some sessions online recently about that. Throughout uh, her life, she was referred to as Kong, meaning older sister, and the editor of the book, A Universal Soul, comments, if Unitarians had saints, she would be one. We now have a prayer, and this is There is No One Greater Than God by Harjom Kisor Singh, a Kazi Unitarian. Let us take a moment for prayer. There is no one greater than God. Today, as in days of old, on high and low, he still governs. Within and without, he discerns. He is with us, he is with us, with us ever and ever. There is one true God, one righteousness and one true religion. To love our God, and love our friends everywhere is our watchword. He is with us, he is with us, with us ever and ever. God is our true father and mother. Human beings are his children. 
both men and women are one family. Rich and poor are his children. He is with us, he is with us, with us ever and ever. May it be so. Amen. Now, our second reading is something of a reading in two parts, and Jane and Brian are going to do the different parts. So, Jane, I believe you have got elder sister in yes. memory. Perhaps, please, could you come up now and read that to us? Elder Sister, in memory of Annie, Annie Margaret Barr, by Reverend Cliff Reed and Hajjam Kisor Singh, by Howard Haig. A Bly, great unity, loving God of many names, we remember and give thanks for the life of Annie Margaret Barr. Her path of Unitarian faith led her to know you in great and humble souls, in loving friends and children, in students and workers, in the hill folk of Meghalaya, North East India, in their scattered villages and bustling towns. We join in gratitude for what Margaret, an elder sister, Kong in the Kazi tongue, did to bring them education and health care and a deeper knowledge of our shared faith and all faiths. For her, there are many paths to the one truth, that humanity is one as you, God, are one, the divine, deep in the being of each of us. We remember with gratitude her long years of service, ministry in a depression hit Yorkshire town, teaching in Kolkata and Shillong, healing, educating, and so much more at her rural centre in Kerang, scene of her life's great work. Her legacy lives there still. Those other Kazi villages too, those simple Unitarian churches, were the setting for her fruitful labours, for joys and achievements, if also for the disappointments, griefs and setbacks which she had to overcome. And those hills and forests and their people were a spiritual resource on which she drew to feed her soul. And now, Fifty years on from her death, ninety years on from her first arrival in India, inspired by Gandhi and the example of Hajjom Kisor Singh, we hold Margaret Barr in fond remembrance and deep respect. We ask what we can do to be true to our calling as she was true to hers. Maybe we too take the way of loving service which she followed. Who bly? God bless and go in peace. Thank you, Jane. And um, as I say, this is a reading in two parts. And as I think we've seen, uh, when Margaret Barr arrived, there was already quite a strong Unitarian presence and many people working very hard in the Kasi Hills uh, to strengthen and build their communities. So let us hear a little about one of them. Hajjom Kisor Singh, by, this is writings by Howard Haig. And Brian, please could you come up and read? Hajjom Kathor Singh was born in 1865 at Cherapunji, which claims to be the wettest place on earth. This area of Assam in the 19th century was under the influence of the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist missionaries. Kisor attended a mission school and at the age of 15 he was converted to this form of Christianity. However, he read widely, and over the next few years, doubts crept in, and he developed a conviction that there should be a form of Christianity closer to the religion of Jesus. At about the age of 20, he left the Welsh Calvinists. A contact from the Brahmo Samaj, a liberal Hindu group, put him in touch with the Reverend Charles Dow, an American Unitarian minister living in Calcutta. He received Unitarian literature from Mr. Dahl and Kissor was delighted to find 
that there were others who shared his approach to faith around the world. And so he became a Unitarian. The first Kazai Unitarian service was held at his home in Jawai on 18th September 1887, a date which continues to be marked today. From these very small beginnings, two men and one woman attended that service. The Kazai Unitarian movement continued to grow until it numbered over 20 churches and some 2,000 members by 1973. Margaret Barr always acknowledged the huge debt that she owed Hajjom Kisor Singh. In a dream come true, she wrote that Kisor was a truly great man and a really great Unitarian. He was a poet and a writer of hymns. He compiled a Unitarian service book which contributed to the permanence of the Unitarian Union in the Kazai Hills. He also composed over 70 hymns and translated many more. He died in 1923, but his work lived on through the work of Margaret Barr and the churches. He deserves to be much better known today. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jane and Ryan. So, we now have another prayer. This is uh, by an unknown author. It's Prayer from the Kazi Hills. And after that, we're going to have a little bit of silent time for our own personal prayer and reflection. Uh, then we'll have a musical interlude. Um, the music I've chosen is a song called The Same Stream of Life uh, by the Virtual Choir of the First Unitarian Church. And it's based on the uh, writings of Rabindrath Tagore, who did our, who mm -hmm. provided our chalice lighting. We are slightly dependent on the Wi-Fi signal for the musical interlude. Um, I feel like you can offer, I'm tempted to, I'm trying not to be flippant and say please offer prayers for that. But, um, but first, let us uh, put our hands together if, and take a moment for prayer. And here is prayer from the Kazi Hills. Oh God. Root and source of body and soul, we ask for boldness in confronting the evils and tribulations that beset us. With you within us, we have the power to outface all that is troublesome and untrue. Mother and father of all humankind, we redeem our failings by the good work that we do. In the name of the one, the only God. Amen. <laughs> so, this uh, service is based on a pack put together uh, by John Hewardine, um, long-standing Unitarian, and actually at this year's General Assembly, uh, he and his wife Dot were granted uh, honorary membership, uh, which is uh, the, actually the highest uh, award our movement can give to somebody. Uh, it's a bit like the LBE, uh, except no, no monarchies are involved. Um, so, Part of his reason in putting together the pack was that uh, he has a connection himself to the Kazi Hills. Um, and Bill is now going to read uh, a piece called My Year <coughs> in the Kazi Hills by John Hewardy. My Year in the Kazi Hills by John Hewardy. My Year in the Kazi Hills started in January 1968 when I arrived with Margaret Barr from Delhi, leaving in December the same year. My time in Magala with Granny was a transformative year for me and I served my time living in the Kerang Orphanage guest house and enjoying breakfast of your patties made for me by the family the night before. As an odd job man, my duties included repairing anything from tables to chairs in the school to fixing a broken handrail on the footbridge down to the Nam, a pond constructed for breeding of fish, where Margaret would take her daily swim. Apart from, Mar apart from walking, which Margaret always enjoyed, swimming was her favourite form of exercise. Margaret did this every day when she had time, and would often walk the 16 miles of glorious footpaths to Shillalong, usually staying the night with Unitarian, Unitarian friends there. The main project I involved myself in during my year there was the acquisition of a ram pump, a pump which uses no fuel, just water pressure from a head of water bouncing on a rubber seal. 
which was beginning to go rusty in the government warehouse in Shillelagh. We purchased suitable steel tubing and I engineered a small reservoir as well as making a number of threaded connections and joints and installed it by a nearby freshwater spring below Margaret's home. This, is, this saved the children their most physically demanding daily chore of carrying water up to the house in the dry season. Perhaps more valuable than the, any of these tasks though was when I participated in regular ga games of Scrabble with Granny. This took place by the light of an old Aladdin powder lamp, most evenings after the last of the children had gone to bed. Our fourth reading is What Did Margaret Barr Achieve? Now this is taken from uh, the Women's League letter from May to June 1974. It was reproduced in a book called A Century of the Unitarian Women's League, which is still going strong. Uh, unfortunately, the author is either not recorded or I don't have it, um, but this is that reading. What Margaret did was to give many hundreds of children a start in life. Many, having learnt to read, were able to conduct the service in the Unitarian Church by following through the service book. Some were able to give a simple short talk, many knew the hymns off by heart. The churches were helped and stimulated to carry on, and today there are 23 churches. Bear in mind this letter was written some time ago. Many of her children went on to Shillong University, and some went on to high positions. Some of her children went on to train as midwives or school teachers. Shillong seemed full of children whom Margaret Barr had touched, many now grown up and married who cared for Margaret and invited her and visiting Unitarians into their homes. In 1949, when the government took over the schools in Shillong, Margaret then went on to Kerang, another thousand feet up in the hills, and developed her maternity centre clinic, a home for nine orphans and a school. She told the author of the letter that she used to go out and ring the school bell at about 4.30 in the morning. When she was asked why, she said that the children had to spend most of the day preventing the cattle from damaging the growing vegetables. This, only t this early time was the only possible time that they could come to school. There is no doubt that she found complete fulfilment in her work. Uh, the author says, I remember a beautiful, cold, crisp and sparkling morning when Margaret woke me before half past five in the morning and said, get up quickly. If we climb for half an hour, we shall get a splendid view of the Himalayan mountains. And we did. Margaret gave her gifts, her money and her health, and so found an inner peace, a fulfilment that is not often found in modern life. She took great pleasure in the poetry of Emily Bronte. After Margaret's death, some lines were found in her desk. These lines, she said, meant more to her than any other. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world, world's storm-troubled sphere. I see heaven's glories shine, and faith shines equal, arming me from fear. I have no great sermon today, but a few thoughts I would share. Um, I tend to listen to the BBC programme Heart and Soul, uh, which can be found online and on the radio. Um, this focuses on a different aspect of religious and spiritual life around the world. Perhaps it's appropriate that this morning I was listening to a programme on Heart and Soul about caste divisions within modern India. I am no expert on the Hindu caste system and would not pretend to be, but it is clear that India is going through a great time of turmoil. Uh, both within the Hindu religion, uh, as some people oppose traditional divisions, others feel that they still give meaning to life. Um, also, there is great division, as many of us I'm sure are aware, between Hindus and Muslims, and also between those who believe India should remain a more secular, multicultural state, and those who want it to become a more Hindu nationalist state. India is hardly alone in that, and I think we can see that same trend across our world. That gives me great fear. I feel we even see, to a certain extent, it playing out in our own country, influenced in our own culture, by people who want one culture to become dominant over all, 
and others who want to maintain Britain as a place where people of all faiths and non and different backgrounds can be equally welcome. Now that is of course my perspective on it, I've no doubt there are others who would take a different perspective. But part of it always is to try and build a world in which we listen to each other and respect each other's differences. I fundamentally believe that's crucial to us as Unitarians. I believe it's what brings people to us and what brings us together. That we do not hold that one way is more right than all the others and we forever seek to have that questioning, learning spirit. Margaret Barr was of course a quite remarkable person uh, in the determination she showed that she would pursue her dream of going to India. And as we saw, she was at great pains to work with people there, not to impose her own way of life or values upon them, but to support them to develop the world that they wanted to build. I really do believe that that constructive spirit is what's needed. Um, I'll do a proper report on the Unitarian General Assembly just gone, um, but not right now. Um, it, I only got back yesterday and I'm still processing it all. I went to bed for about 10 hours afterwards. Um, it's a long drive from Daventry. Um, but I was involved in a piece of work around social action, thanks to anybody who took part in that survey. Unitarians uh, said that their main priorities at the moment they called, considered to be climate justice, economic justice, uh, peace initiatives, and in many cases also homelessness and housing. And it was noticeable how many congregations said that that was their main local issue. I think perhaps also because a lot of us are based in um, near city centres. Obviously we had rough sleepers around our building when we were at our old building. Um, many congregations are trying to find the right way to support people, whilst at the same time being aware that as the owners of the property, they need, well, we're all aware of the whole practical considerations, what does the insurance say, but also we want to provide shelter to people, but we also don't want place, places to become places of unsafety if they are out of the way and people might be in danger by going there. It's a really hard balance to strike. But it was clear that there was a great commitment to social action, uh, to putting our values of respect and tolerance, and I'd hope also love for others, inspired by whatever we considered to be spiritual. And I did notice one person when I did the analysis saying, in a sense, I see all these things as interlinked. The, the challenge of facing injustice in the world, economic injustice, whereby some, in, some enjoy far more fruits of the world than others, often through no great hard work, but simply through fortune or inheritance. That is a great challenge, but it is also exacerbated by climate uh, change and the impacts on our world. And also by peace, because peace truly is a driver of inequality. To eat peace drives equality and war drives inequality, and often the two cannot be separated. Uh, they saw the war in Ukraine as a war of inequality in a sense, of one nation wanting to take another and steal, as they saw it, steal the resources and claim that territory as their own. Many see wars around the world in similar ways. So, None of us can claim to have solutions to that, but I believe Margaret Barr gives us a great inspiration of how a person can live their values uh, and by through her spirit of love and tolerance and commitment, she made a real difference to the lives of everybody she touched and I believe we can take her example as inspiration because whilst it must have seemed incredibly difficult sometimes to try and educate children who had to get up tremendously early to get to school, and to live in buildings which I imagine were not very well heated or plumbed because of the challenges people there face. Uh, to work with people to have to try and find ways to get water to them in places where you weren't going to be able to plug the pump in or easily maintain it. But she faced all of that and she inspired others and I believe she can be a real inspiration to us. Those are my thoughts for today. Put out the chalice, let's it remains within us until we gather again. And let's close with these words from another unknown <coughs> author from the Kazi Hills. Oh God, we thank you as we close this service. Let all truths we have heard abide in us, so that our lives may be worth living. And let us feel your presence in us forever and ever. Amen.